We could more rigorously enforce existing laws on water conservation, like since 1991, you had to have a system to turn the sprinkler off when it, you didn't need to have more irrigation water. But is it really the best thing to have any so-called efficient automatic irrigation system, or should we really have strong encouragement for people not to put in landscapes that require tens of thousands of gallons of water every year, so long as the house is there? If we have time, maybe I can start a fight about Florida friendly. <laughs> Anybody want to do that? <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, another innovation would be to have water managers and governing boards look like Florida. <laughs> uh, I like the bottom two bullets a lot, but that's unrepresentative, at least, you know. And I. Recall that the distrust people have in institutions. There's reason for that. If you don't have Floridians look like Floridians and actually represent all types of Floridians and things that matter to them. Uh, this is the best Studley Toolbox one. If you're willing to drive to Cedar Rapids, Iowa in two weeks and pay 25 bucks for a ticket, you can go in a room and examine the Studley tool chest up close. <laughs> a light on this potential ticket buyer. You know? So this is a tool porn, right? <laughs> or tool worship. Back to my harsh historical analogy. Uh, I believe to some degree I know you're not supposed to say history repeats itself, but I think there's sometimes things happen that are similar, or there's threads that uh, continue. Failures representing democracy, question mark, worsening inequality. Third one really hard is cruelty. Woo! Why am I on a water meeting talking about cruelty to people? Uh, ignoring climate change and diminishing of sustainability. I'm going to talk about those a little bit. Uh, a few years ago, the legislature made it harder for some sorts of people to vote in Florida. And the bottom bullet, of course, is money, money, money. It's absolutely shocking, the influence of money in Florida politics. Those pork choppers had no idea what, was, what they could have done. <laughs> uh, a, a lesser known statistic is that Florida has a second worst state income inequality of any state. And I think that matters too. Are Floridians willing to fund proper water management? Do they have the energy to care about the future water in Florida if they have gross inequality? Uh, we are reading about the legislature and Medicaid. It looks like the Senate's going to stick to it uh, until they don't. But We've had two years pass in Florida where we could have expanded Medicaid, and there's a report, 68,000 Floridians with untreated mental health disorders. I hope nobody here. Yeah. <laughs> but you might know somebody, or maybe you're that person. We have the 47th highest rate of uninsured children of any state. And I just can't call that record anything but cruel. I mentioned distrust in institutions. The, uh, this line is whether you trust most of, oops, most of the time, or only some of the, instead of the crossing. Less trust of institutions, which is horribly corrosive for everything you might want to do as a society. Introduced species are not a challenge larger than imagined in 1971. The Burmese python seems to have eaten all the small mammals in the Everglades. I'm exaggerating. I bet you know about water hyacinths. There's another introduced species. Oh, grass. Grass. Maybe the species with the highest acreage in Florida. I should have looked that up. It's the highest acreage nationally. 
of any irrigated crop. Climate change, this one is kind of confusing. The laser isn't working, but the red color, the darker color, this is change in number of days over 95 degrees. And the red is 40 and 50 and above. So by 2080, the National Climate Assessment, unless we change greenhouse gas emissions, say there's going to be 40 or 50 more days per year, 95 and higher. That sounds kind of hot. But it also means a lot for water in all kinds of ways. Sea level rise. President Obama is down in the Everglades, swatting mosquitoes and deer flies, I understand, <laughs> talking about the need to have meaningful climate change policies. The red on this figure is the area below five feet above mean sea level. And I see different numbers, but by the end of the century, unless things change dramatically, most of the numbers seem to say two, three, four, five, six feet by the end of the century. So, do we need new tools? Do we need a new toolbox? It's kind of the question. Or maybe we need to get studly out of our minds somehow. It's impossible now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he's a very nice guy. A very nice guy. Must have been kind of fussy, though, right? <laughs> well, we might want to go back to Mr. Natural, <laughs> uh, whose most famous saying might have been, get the right tool for the job. And, you know, I looked at that during his presentation. That depends on the job, right? <laughs> you got the right tool, and you have to be able to get that tool. And all three of those are relevant to uh, thinking about water policy in Florida. So, although the tools in the water policy toolbox are extremely valuable, and many of them work extremely well, I think it's fair to ask if we need to talk about the system above the water toolbox. And these are some things that I write down at least. You probably have other things. Money in politics, decarbonizing, reducing cynicism. This is all a, a cheery, trusting group, right? <laughs> Lowering inequality, increasing citizen participation. Those seem to me to be pretty important for the system above the water toolbox. And what might make that happen? Uh, this poor fellow is looking at the effects of the drought. The 1972 Water Resources Act followed up after a big drought. Oh, we're in a drought, we're in a big drought, we're going to do something. And in fact, they did quite a lot in Florida. Is it going to be a change in human attitudes about our fellow travelers on the earth? Fellow prisoners, actually, Roy and Bestin put it. There's a famous saying attributed to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas that was actually a scene written by Joe Podler, who worked her from the Everglades, which she is, he or she is quoted as saying is, the Everglades is a test. If we pass, we get to keep the planet. But I think actually with climate change, if we keep the planet, we get to keep the Everglades is the way it actually works now. Uh, if you search at Flickr, you get all sorts of non-copyrighted images. And this one, I think, is some dreamy, ultimate, omega point of human consciousness, is what I'm going to call it. Right? Is that coming? <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> I don't see the future very clearly, but maybe. Uh, we have to think about civil rights again. Uh, this was in the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago. It's kind of neat. Uh, on the left are the states in 2014 that still don't allow 
marriage equality. On the right is ones that didn't allow interracial marriage in 1966. And the point of the graphic is, looks like there's some similarity there. <laughs> that uh, enduring concerns kind of stand. Now, it's always been something kind of a puzzle why Florida has really what may be one of the very best water management systems of any state. When it's also grouped with a bunch of states like this. And one of the reasons for that is I believe we have especially valuable and vulnerable water resources. And we had some superb elected leaders. This is a, a climate march, citizen engagement, uh, mass movement. Skip right over the last toolbox for you. <laughs> this is the final one. Uh, another Marjorie Stoneman Douglas who achieved so much against such odds <coughs> and at the beginning with very few allies. And she said, you have to stand up for some things in this world. And maybe that's a key. And you people who took the time and effort to show up to listen to some guy from Tallahassee talk about water are probably the kind of people that stand up for some things in your life. So thank you all. Okay. So um, I'm going to moderate or facilitate the questions as I did if you were here the last time, just so we get everybody heard and get as many questions off the floor, etc. So if you raise your hand, I promise I will try to get to you over time. Blue. Tom, the Swan River Water Management District has admitted that the Santa Fe River and the Hitchcock River are both impaired, and yet they keep issuing water use permits. Is there anything that we can do as citizens to better get our point across that it's not just about the springs, it's about the aquifer, and if the aquifer gets damaged, we're all going to suffer? How do, we, how do we deal with these issues when the Water Management District admits there's a problem but doesn't really do anything about it? Well, I believe they will say that the Florida Water Act that I so highly commended allows the recovery strategy, has a, an associated recovery strategy that can contemplate additional withdrawals during the period of recovery. So I think one answer is it's legal. But another answer is they decided to do that. And I don't have any special insight in how you get them to undecide that. I imagine we take a different instructions from Tallahassee or perhaps a different governing board. Thanks. Yeah, back there. Um, my name is Judy, and I'm kind of advocating for people who have their own wells, residential wells. And can you tell me, are people starting to advocate for charging for water? I know that when you buy water from a utility, you only pay for what it takes to bring the water from the utility to your house. But I have my own pump, and about five, six years ago, I paid about $3,500 for a new pump. I had to go deeper, and also for a filter. And when I'm, I'm starting to hear people say that I should pay per gallon for water. But I look around and I see Nestle and all over the world. Um, and they are, they are, poor people are being denied free water by people who have money and by people who come in and buy up the water rights. So can you tell me, is it going to be that we will pay for water? It's no longer free? I think it's quite unlikely that you would ever pay for your water. That's just a wish that I would have and some other people I have and economists love. And I've never heard of any proposal to impose a volumetric fee on private domestic wells. If it worked at all, it would be somebody who gets a permit from the water management district 
and reports every month on how many hundreds of thousands or millions of gallons would have a fee with that. And in this imaginary world, in my imaginary world, the water management districts would reduce their property taxes to make up for that fee. So it makes a lot of sense to me, theoretically. But uh, the only proposal I'm aware of in recent years, although there's things pop up now and again because it's a good idea, is Governor Charlie Crist kind of supported a fee on water bottling for a little while. That's as far as I think it's gone recently. Yes. Stacy. Yeah. Okay. So while we're talking about um, domestic wells, sometimes it gets brought up that if you raise the water price of water, people will put in irrigation wells. Um, and I've heard um, that it is against the law to prohibit um, people from putting in irrigation wells. So I wonder if you could speak to that. I've heard the district said that they can't limit that. I'm wondering the, the Tallahassee perspective of South Florida Water Management District and the Southwest Florida Water Management District, and not to my knowledge, Sewanee or St. John's, have encountered that problem, and they've worked with local governments to try to assure that doesn't happen, that people don't simply stick in a well and have the same effect with free pump water as water from the central system. But there can be that diversion of uh, water use. But there are also some tools, at least, to try to address that. Would you say something about the relative efficacy uh, between the CUPs, NFLs, and water feeds? It seems to me that, that the, the NFLs and CUPs aren't working for any number of reasons. Ambiguities, subterfuge, you name it. Uh, whereas a water fee could be could be reckoned rather rather precisely, and uh, and we could finally manage our water. I'm a big believer in water use fees. I'm a very big believer in water use fees. Uh, I also want to note that in Florida, water use hasn't been increasing, at least statewide in aggregate, for a number of years. And there are some really good water use permitting programs, and some really water good water use permits. And I think those that need to continue even if there were a water use fee. But it really is a way to wake up somebody who uses half a million gallons a day to put a fee on it. And it could be two ways. One is that could cost. And the other is just a point of human psychology. People don't like to pay a fee, period. You know? So they tend to be more careful if there's going to be even a little fee. Agriculture uses so much water, and ever since this Supreme Court case of Citizens United, where lobbyists get so much power, can you cite any situation in Florida where citizens have been able to be effective standing up against the agricultural lobbies? <laughs> <laughs> from the Everglades agriculture area in the last 15 years. And they've met all the target levels. That's a very special case, for sure. And one reason it's interesting is that the Everglades agriculture area is a, you know, a place, but it's also covered by a drainage district. And there's a fee charge to the district if the nutrient standards are not met, the tons of discharge. And the district, elected by agriculturalists, collectively has met that goal. And it would be a great study to see just how they work with the local farmers. It must be a fun meeting, you know. We noticed last year from monitoring you had 15 tons. We can't do anything into you really directly, but you got to get that. I mean. So all that kind of thing happens if you have a fee 
on activities. So there's an example. <laughs> the dairy. You the dairy? Uh, sugar, not much sugar. Coming to you next, Steve. Hey? Steve. Um, have you ever seen in the future land use regulation where uh, areas of springships uh, are not allowed to farm very high? Why do you use crop like crop the right? Um, I think a local government could do that right now. It's a matter of density zoning or use zoning. And I believe there's a lot of places in Florida, this area in particular, where people do get concerned and exercise about developments that might harm the springs. I can't imagine Tallahassee saying we're going to have statewide zoning. No, that's not going to happen. The local governments have great power. They have substantial power. Okay, I've got a question here, please. My distrust in the St. John's River Water Management District uh, escalated greatly when I realized that some of the governing board members, I'm not sure if it's all of them, but I know some of them, contract with the permit applicants. And as an example, I was at one of the meetings when the chair of the governing board, so there was a woman there, a permit applicant that was looking for an extension and an increase, and um, the governing board chair said, oh, I have to review myself from voting because my company is representing that golf course. So, he was the chair of the governing board, and his company was helping her, was hired by the golf course to help her get her permit. And um, I know there's some other ones that um, I'm sure there's a lot going on that I'll never be privy to. But if the governing board members are contracting with the permit applicants and their income is dependent on the success of those applicants getting their permits, doesn't Which sound right, does it? Yeah, it's not. It doesn't sound right. No, it's very, to me, it's extremely corrupt. How, how, can, how could that be turned around? Well, I don't know the circumstances, but you did note that the person recused himself. Uh, ultimately, that would require the governor laying down policies on the allowable conflict of interest. I mean, if you're on the governing board of a water management district, you're probably an influential person. You probably have connections with people, you know. But the degree of conflict and the necessity for recusing could be specified by the governor, or I suppose in the statute. Or you can you can protest. I guess I don't really know. I don't really know. I objected to that, but they just you know. I'm feeling completely powerful, so you just wave it off. I mean, that's, their, that's to me, that's why they're in that position, is to, it's a very influential position to be able to get those contracts because they're, they're sitting there supposedly determining who gets the permits. I just don't know the specifics. Jim, I'm coming to you. Uh, my question is a little bit similar to Karen's. Coming to you, Karen. I know at one time you were, you were, uh, Health position, I think, was similar to Drew Bottles today, which is uh, no, you did not. He over he now oversees what uh, something like that I used to supervise. Well, if you look, see the little hair, hair I, that uh, you see, you see the water management district, and you see, I believe, his position, and then above him is the government, governor, and then lastly, they above the governor is supposed to be people. <laughs> Could you speak just a bit about the autonomy of these different levels? For example, uh, as Karen was saying, if you have a, a, a farmer that's pulling a huge uh, permit, a uh, withdrawal permit, do the water management board people decide that? Are they getting a lot of pressure from Drew Bartlett? Are they getting a lot of pressure from the governor? Or is it all from the ag lobbyists? Can you speak a little bit about how this balances out and who is really pulling the strings? Well, the water management district had never been pristinely pure examples of 
political science untinted from any taint of politics. But the leadership comes down from the governor. And I can say that one of the features of the water management district, for a number, for decades at least, was their ornery independence. <laughs> they sometimes were a real pain in the butt for we people in Tallahassee. And see, in Tallahassee, DEP gripes about the water management district, but DEP gripes about EPA. So that's, that's kind of the way it works. Uh, but that ornery independence meant they were able to do creative things. They were able to sometimes make a decision and carry it through against opposition. And they represented their communities very strongly. And all those characteristics, I believe, have been diminished. It's more a state department of water resources than five semi-independent, difficult to work with, often creative, regional institutions. I find it interesting that we don't have any environmentalists on these boards. Yeah. Interesting. You find that interesting. Yeah. <laughs> 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 love, love the, the comments that come after the question. Absolutely love that. Yes, sir? Um, uh, minimum flows and levels uh, is, a, is a tool came right out of the model water code went into the Water Resources Act in 1972. Uh, great idea, but over the last few years, it, it's gotten harder and harder for districts to uh, to establish NFLs in the low level because of the conflict with the legislature, because of litigation and, and other complicated factors uh, with peer review and whatnot. There's another tool in the box that has not been used as much: reservation. Do you think that tool is possibly underutilized given where we are with the difficulties at the minimum level? This gentleman knows too much. <laughs> <laughs> That's a trick question. <laughs> we'll cut him off, don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, you don't have to answer no, no, that. No, no, no. Uh, my view is I think either one of them could work very well. To me, it's always been kind of klutzy. The toolbox has a section called NFLs and another section called reservations. And there's often a discussion about which tool should we use. And I kind of think they're both screwdrivers, hammers, you know. Uh, they both can be made to work if you want them to work. I think your comment was really profound in that over recent years, there's been many, many obstacles to adopting minimum flows and levels. I did write about this with my blog one time. Uh, the legislature doesn't adopt a law saying minimum flows and levels are forbidden. Instead, they create a web of obstacles that make it really hard. And God bless the people at the Water Manager District, but nonetheless, they're getting it done. But it's Harder. In the back. I think I heard you say that um, there, the, the citizens, the communities can create some surprisingly good impacts locally. Can you give us some good examples and encouraging examples of that? Did I, did I hear you correctly? <laughs> I rather like Cascades Park in Tallahassee, for example. <laughs> That's my home, really, there, you know. Uh, I know that Gainesville has a number of creative measures. What's the name of that development? Pardon? Gaines Parish Youth Club Project? No, I was thinking of, there's a sub, there isn't there a subdivision that doesn't Madeira. have much Madeira. Madeira. irrigation? Madeira? Yeah, Madeira. Yeah, there's a lot of creative things going on. You know this area a lot more better than I do. Nobody going to stick up with the idea that anything good happens? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I go to a lot of meetings about water. BMAT, Orange Creek Basin. Uh, I've been up to Tal uh, Tallahassee for rallies for water. For the springs, I've been to the water mat, St. John's River Water Management District meetings. And uh, I think we have 
a tool in our toolbox called regulation. But over and over again, I see agencies saying, we don't regulate. It's almost as though it's become a dirty, dirty word. Mm -hmm. Is there any way you can get the water management districts to regulate or um, FDP to regulate? Who regulates? <laughs> Well, on day one, in Rick Scott's term as governor, the first day, he set up some sort of regulatory review process and said agencies must reduce their number of rules. And agencies went through the rules and eliminated some and didn't eliminate some by combining them with others. I mean, it's so silly. But I can only say there's a very strong prejudice against regulation. I'm not I'm far enough to be able to tell you anything more than what you know. Yes, So when I was reading your PowerPoints, having a better diversity represented with this group of men, which is traditionally men at the moment, who are making all the decisions, who have their pockets and hands and whatever, and all the stuff that they're giving advice to. Um, how do we change that diversity? Like where, I know that's in the local elections we did, and where, where do these people get their Well, they're all appointed by the are governor. They, they they're, they're appointed by the governor. Okay, so the governor is appointing The governor the appoints them. So in, essentially what you're saying is our generation has to wait for all of you to die off until <laughs> No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying you might consider electing different people or the legislature and a different person as governor. But they don't give us their phone book to tell us who they're doing something. Have I been too pessimistic tonight? No. Things do change. Things do change in surprising ways. Well, that's kind of a question. Yes, Scott, go ahead. So one of the things I found most surprising about, especially about the Kentucky Alliance lawsuit, was that we found um, ourselves being opposed by the utilities. Um, these are the very organizations that stand to lose the most monetarily when our wells start sucking up salt water. Um, back at the envelope calculation, I, I estimated it would cost about $26 billion to replace just the flow coming out of our springs. Um, but why is it that the utilities seem to be shooting themselves in the foot? Um, and why are they on our side preserving what is a very cheap source of fresh water that's at risk? What is your answer to that question? <laughs> <laughs> they, they like the idea of building very expensive machines and sticking us for price. Hmm. Is it short? Is it short termism or uh, the combination? I don't have an answer for that, but uh, it's a noble profession to provide clean drinking water for people. It really is, and maybe sometimes people get carried away. I've noticed. I don't, I don't have an answer to your question. I'm sorry. I've noticed utilities coming together with ag and two, so that they had more political power. Um, did you have a question? I thought I saw your hand up, and then Bob and Lou, I'll come to you. You commented about things do change. So what I want to know is, what changed from the 60s to the election of Agnew, and can we repeat that today? <laughs> <laughs> what, what happened if you managed to actually get rid of these people? I had the picture with the changing personal consciousness with the rays <laughs> flying out. <laughs> Also, citizen, citizens, can, citizens can citizens can demand things, and surprising things happen. Now, what happened, I believe, is important is that the United States Supreme Court required representative government in America for peace' sake. You know, Florida would not have gotten out of unrepresentative without that. And what will uh, cause a system change now? Uh, we may not be able to predict it. It may not happen. It could be citizens just get sick and tired and change their mind. Uh, 
In one of your slides, you had money, money, money. I think everybody will agree, you know, that's a major problem here in Florida. In your book, you mentioned that the production of food and fiber in the state of Florida accounts for seven-tenths of one percent of the gross domestic product in the state of Florida. These two don't compute. Would you care to comment? Uh, it's a surprising fact, and reading about California, I was surprised again that in California, it's only 2% of their state's economy, even mm -hmm. though they're, you know, the fruit and vegetable basket. Mm -hmm. And the almond basket, I guess, for the whole world. It's not just Florida. Agriculture is armored with a shield of favorable views among the general public. I mean, people think agriculture is old McDonald on his farm, I guess, partly, you know. Uh, but also, I don't know of any economic group that has a longer history of working closely together to protect their economic interests in agriculture. They are hard working at it, and they never let up. So maybe that's related to the other question, is how you make a change you work really hard at it for decades. They, they do that. Luke, North Florida has the largest concentration of freshwater springs on the planet. To me, that's a water treasure that's every bit as equivalent to the Everglades in South Florida. Are there any things in the water policy toolbox that we could try to do that we are not doing? And by we, I mean citizens, water management districts, everybody, to protect the springs. Do we need some kind of special spring zone designation? Do we need um, what? What can we do more and differently than what we're already doing? Well, again, you probably know better than I for this area, but uh, the tools in the current water toolbox are extremely powerful. Uh, here's an example. To get a water use permit, one must demonstrate efficiency. Who decides how efficient? Those nine people on the governing board of the water management district. You know? They could say it is unreasonable to do this current practice, or it's unreasonable unless it's half to, that'd be an example. Those tools are available for use. Uh, one example. But I'm not big on always saying individual social action personally. That's my preference. You know, don't run the faucet while you're brushing your teeth. You shouldn't run the faucet while you're brushing your teeth. But a lot more has happened by collective action in my view, you know? Uh, so that is where big changes happen, is where policy changes are made, either using the current tools or new tools, in my view.
you had mentioned you had alluded to Florida friend, Florida friendly, um, and you know the University of Florida uh, gets money from the state and all the counties uh, to promote Florida friendly. Um, it's got all kinds of gold stars, but maybe you have some opinions about it as well. Can you share? Well. <laughs> I, if I want to be a troublemaker, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I think will support you. You say it to me. I want to be. If I wanted to be a troublemaker, I would uh, wonder how much less water Florida Friendly yards actually use, and I would wonder if it's Florida Friendly to even irrigate a Florida Friendly landscape or not. <laughs> now people hate me. <laughs> the garden John, take me. Excuse me, Tom. John? Isn't it really more, maybe less about the tools and the rocks than the willingness of our folks that are in position, or there's some more management districts with the AP to actually uh, use the tools and enforce the tools? I mean, you, you mentioned the such good use permits and you said what's required is proof of efficiency. To a lot of us, it seems it's what's required to get a something use permit in these parts of the pulse and, and the nerve to ask for. Uh, I mean, they're, they're not turned out very often. And on NFLs and reservations of rights, uh, a lot of us have become very discouraged about um, the effectiveness of those, no matter what the NFLs are adopted, if they're not, uh, if the teeth in them aren't used, they, they don't do much. Is it, is it really more about who sits on these boards and who wants them and then make the tools and the tool box? I think that's my view. My view is the policy makers implement the policies. And uh, policy makers have a very important job of deciding what they're going to do. And if you want to change some of the policies, you might need to change some of the policy makers. Uh, I do. Uh, I, maybe, I think I have introduced some grimness. Uh, I've been reading on California, you know, they've got the big drought there. What are they going to do? What are they going to do? Their water management system is horrible compared to Florida. Just ghastly. <laughs> In terms of the inability to do stuff even, you know? So uh, we in Florida still have a pretty darn good system compared to most states, I believe. Take one more, two more maybe, and then we're going to give Tom a break. Bob? Uh, I want to respond to the ladies' comments over there about the air plays in spring. Um, the springs are endangered ecosystems. Basically, clear water aquatic systems, freshwater systems are probably the smallest, have the smallest area of any natural ecosystems in Florida. There's probably less than 10,000 acres of springs and spring runs in the state of Florida. I don't have the exact number, but that's a rough estimate. Uh, the Everglades is a million acres. Uh, so this is an endangered uh, aquatic ecosystem. The other thing is that the federal government, <laughs> the federal government essentially does own those springs. The waters of the United States. They can protect them for the exact same reasons the Everglades got protection. They could sue the state of Florida about not enforcing the Clean Water Act. All the power is there, but we have the same issue with the federal government that we have with the state government. It's being run by people that are some people that are spineless in, in terms of environmental protection. But a lot of us think that it's only the federal government that can resolve the springs issues, too. So I just, there are endemic species, obviously, in the springs, similar to the other place. And considering such a small area of the state of springs, it's much more endangered than saying about communities and you know, bogs and whatever, or the other place. So we're, we're in the epicenter of you know, springs and national say, park. Yeah, and I was really talking about species numbers, actual biological which is just always the height. Um, but no, I, 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 totally, I totally agree with you. And, and thanks for bringing that up, that there is the protection there could be, and should be. Yeah, there it's is. It's in the law. It's, it's in the law that springs are water the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. Palmer. <laughs> 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 well, I, I called on Bob. I wasn't going to do Bob, too. I had to call on Bob. <laughs> Tom, you talked about the need to change in leadership, and Dr. Knight just kind of referred to the same thing. 
And most of this, us in this room probably look at what the legislature does and we just cry, how can they do that? They're nuts. But I want to ask you from a long experience, do you know of a single legislative or gubernatorial race in the last 40 years that's been decided on water issues? <laughs> or someone who's just so bad they got thrown out of office? Because that's really what it takes. People say we've got to change the leadership. Well, what, it needs to be demonstrated that they're voting against people's interests. So I'm just wondering, has that ever happened? Because I can't think of one. Well, I can't answer that question, but I do know that Jim Bush in 1996, 96, his first run, 92, was criticized for not saying enough environmental things, and he said more in 1996 after his loss four years before, and he thought it mattered, so maybe it did. I guess you could say it kind of told the Scott because he had the last minute Half a percent. There you go. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Paul. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming tonight. Great question. Thank you all.